motors, okay? So there's two options for motors. There's Victor's and there's Talon's. There's other options as well, but these are probably the two most common, okay? So we're gonna zoom in here and look at what it takes to write your code to control the um, motors, okay? So in this case, I'm gonna use CAN Talon motors, okay? I have four motors. Let's say I have a right motor, two right motors and two left motors, okay? And does anybody know what the difference between a master and slave is? For the motors? <laughs> yeah. Right? So if you have a master, you can set up one motor as a master, and then you can set up another motor as a slave, and it will follow the same command as the master. Okay? So again, when you're using the can talons, you can set them up that way. Okay? So what we're going to do is you're going to basically define four variables for the different motors, and then you're going to instantiate a new class for each motor. Okay, so right here I have to create a new um, right motor master, and that's going to be a can talon one. Does anybody know what the one represents? Channel. The channel, or actually the this is the can bus ID. Okay, so when you're doing can talons, they can run on the can bus, or you can run them off of PWM if you want to, but that would be the the device ID. Okay. Um, in this case, you can also set feedback, okay, so if you want to add an encoder, if you're going to do a, um, a quadrature encoder and feed it back through the can talon, you can set up a, a feedback device, you can say it's an encoder. Um, there's also a bunch of different control modes for um, a talon, but right now this is just a percent V bus, which is just power. Right, you can control the power or the voltage to that um, motor. Okay. Um, this is in, this is configuring the encoder. How many ticks per revolution the encoder is? So, does anybody know there's two common size encoders? Does anybody know what the other value is? So sometimes there's a 512, um, a 256, and maybe even a 128. Okay, so you have to pay attention to how many um, ticks per revolution your encoders are. Okay. And then the next piece here is setting the position. This is zeroing out the encoder position. Okay. So I'm going to do that for that uh, right master talent. Now I'm also going to then set up another channel for the slave. <laughs> So I'm going to do can talent 2 as a slave to the master. And I'm just going to, I have to set the control mode to follower, okay? And then I have to tell it the, the master that it's going to follow, so I have to set the device ID for that master. Okay, then I'm going to do the same thing for can talent 3. I'm going to set that for the left motor master, set the encoder type for the feedback, um, can then control it as percent V bus, set the encoder ticks, and reset the position. Okay? And then finally, for the fourth one, I'm going to set a follower to the, the right, to the left master. Okay? So does that make sense for instantiating the, the motors? Okay? So that's basically how we get started with the can talent. Okay. Now one thing is they changed the packaging on how you have to import the classes last year. They went with um, Cross the Roads, you have to use their library instead of the WPI lib library. So um, if you didn't have to do it last year, um, I do a little Google search on that and it's pretty straightforward and have to set that up. Okay. All right. You can do the same thing pretty much with a Victor. Okay, Victors connect instead of hooking them up to CAN, you can hook them up to a PWM output. All right, so we'll zoom in here and go through that code. Okay, so I'm going to 
set up the Vicker. So in this case, I actually have three motors on the left and three motors on the right. And then I actually have encoders defined for the left and the right. Okay. Victors don't let you build, they don't have built-in encoder logic, so you have to use separate encoders, and then we put those encoders directly into the uh, Rubble Rio. Okay. So then when I'm initializing that setup, I have to initialize my encoders, so I have to create a new encoder object, um, I have to set the distances per pulse, and then I want to reset the encoder. Okay. Um, in this case, we're creating a variable to capture the current position as an offset, so we can zero it out ourselves. Um, then I have to do a write encoder, same way, and then I can instantiate my victors. Okay, so my left motors are victor 5, so it's in, in this case 10, and then um, my right ones are 7, 8, and 11. Okay. So these numbers correspond with the PWM port. Does anybody know why um, 10 and 11 are higher? They exceed the number of ports on your Robo Rio. Anybody know why that's the case? Okay. So on the Robo Rio, there's an expansion port. Okay. So when you use a NAVX. Um, Gyro, they expand out the uh, the number of PWM ports. So I believe there's like eight built into the Robo Rio, and I think there's like four or eight more on the expansion port. So all you do is you use these numbers to add additional PWM outputs. Okay. So that's vector code. That's setting up a, a vector motor controller in Java. Okay, so now I can control my motors. I have to now feed input into my motors. Okay, so in Teleop, I'm going to use the game pads to do that. Okay, so I have my game pads. I have a driver and operator. They're going to be fed through the driver station, which is then going to send the signal through the Wi Fi to the Robo Rio. Okay. But I want to use, I want to have code here that works with the joystick class. Okay, so I create two joysticks, one for the driver, one for the operator. And then I'm going to have different variables for like turning on my intake or putting my gear um, grabber together or um, controlling the forward power or the rotational power, okay? So I create variables for that. And then I, I instantiate my joysticks, um, and then I go through and I call this logic in a loop, okay? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say, I think this is arcade mode, okay? So we're running in arcade mode. Um, I'm gonna say forward power is some gain <coughs> times the joystick. And then the, the axes is the up-down axes on the left joystick is axes 1. So the joystick class has a bunch of different axes, and you really have to play with the driver station to test and figure out what, which ones represent what part of the, uh, the joystick. Okay. And then rotational power is going to be the other joystick value. Okay. And then I'm going to feed those elements into some variables, and then I'm going to pass those variables to the motor controller to control the power to uh, drive the robot. Okay. You can also use, um, if you want to use a trigger, you can use a trigger on the joysticks. So in this case, we use a trigger for like an on-off switch. We turn our intake on when we press the trigger. I think this is the right trigger and then uh, the intake goes off if we let go of the right trigger. Um, we also created another class that basically does a, uh, um, we debounce our buttons, because if you don't, sometimes you'll, you'll detect double presses. Um, and we actually have a toggle, 
where we can toggle it on or off. So when you press a button one time, it toggles on. You press it again, it toggles off. Um, so you can create a custom class for doing that. And that's kind of what we did. So if I want to control or know if I'm clamping on a gear, I'm going to call that class and I'm going to basically get the state, whether it's on or off. Okay. So these are all ways of processing the inputs from the gamepad. Okay. So how many of you are familiar with the joystick class? Anybody from last year familiar with that? Okay. So a lot of people, it's probably new to that. Um, the best thing is to um, create some code, read from the joystick class, and then we'll get into how you can write the data back to a dashboard. Okay, so you can use the smart dashboard to actually uh, log that data to to see what the joystick's doing. Okay. All right, next thing is, uh, what are the different options for driver controls? Okay. Um, one of the common driver controls is gamepad, or tank drive. Right, tank drive, you use the two joysticks up and down, and the code is pretty easy. Right, you have left power is equal to some game times uh, the joystick value. And negative is always forward. So if we want to reverse forward to make it positive, we need to put a negative sign in front of it. Okay? So that's one thing to remember with the joysticks is when you go forward with the joystick, it gives you a negative value back. So we reverse that value. And then right drive is basically the other joystick, um, forward and backwards. So it's really two lines of code to take the input from the joystick and convert it to the power that I want to send to the motors for your left and your right motor. Okay. Now, another thing is you can control, we add gains to our joystick output. So your joystick output goes from zero to one, or zero to one and zero to negative one, based on the output of the joystick. Now, your motors, you can control your motors and you can go from negative one to one as well. But if I want to actually reduce the amount of power going to my motors, I could put in a gain of, um, say, 0.5. So if I put in a gain of 0.5, how much power would I send to my motors if I'm fully going forward on my joystick? Half the power, right? So. If you have a driver who is really, you know, it's full throttle all the time, you can reduce his power by adjusting your gain. So we, we usually give them like 80% power, okay? And that saves your battery too, all right? So there's a lot you can do in the software. All right, next, next is the arcade or halo drive, okay? It's not much more complicated. It's just changing some of the, uh, the axes that you use. And then um, we have a forward reverse power, which is the same as the uh, tank drive. But then we have a rotational power, which is basically a different axis. And we also add a function called a dead band. Okay? So a dead band is basically when the joystick is, you're not touching the joystick, it may have a little bit of noise. So it may sense it going forward or reverse a little bit. So we basically zero out that area so that there's a little bit of a dead band there and it doesn't instantly try to drive the motors when you're not touching the joystick. Okay. Um, there's another type of drive, which is a mechanum drive, which is a little more complicated in terms of the code. But the good thing is they have an example project. So you can just take the code and, and look at it. But basically with a mechanum drive, you're forward, reverse, left, right. And what they do is they, you have to figure out the polar coordinates of what direction you're heading. And then it basically tries to take the sine and the cosine of those angles 
to calculate how much power to put to the each of the four drive motors. Okay. So that's a little bit more complicated approach for for controlling your uh, uh, your drivetrain. Okay. So I have a little diagram here. This is. There's another thing you can do, and you may see it in some of the example code. It's where you square the input from the joystick. And that affects kind of the sensitivity of your drive. Okay? So if you have a joystick and you just go forward, reverse, it's linear. Okay? So when I go forward with my joystick, it just keeps incrementing until you get all the way. Okay? And there's no there's no real soft spot at zero. So it just it starts going forward or starts going in reverse. But what they often do is when you're trying to do fine control, they square the output of the joystick. So it actually creates more of an exponential curve. So when I move the joystick just a little bit, it doesn't do a lot. And then as you move it further, it starts to um, do more. So. If you want to play around with real fine control of your motors or your drivetrain or even an arm or a manipulator, you can square that input and it will give you a different feel. Okay? Depends on what the driver's like and how your system works. Okay? But it's a very common thing to do. Okay? Any questions, any thoughts? Okay. Um, it's as easy as just taking the joystick value and multiply it by itself. And you just square it. So it's pretty easy to do. Okay. So this is another slide that kind of goes through the same thing. So if I have a joystick, my input is, you know, linear, negative one to one. And then I add a dead band. So I can add a dead band function with just some logic. You know, if the joystick value is less than 0.1 and greater than negative 0.1, make the output zero, and that would add a dead band. Okay. Um, the problem sometimes with that is you may have some kind of a, a weird clipping where once you go over that threshold, it will jump to the actual value. If you want to have a more um, optimal dead band, you'd have to do some logic to control that offset and make that function nice and smooth. Okay? So that's what the dead band is doing. And then if you want to do some kind of gain scheduling where I want to control the driver, right? I want to reduce their power by half. That's essentially what you're doing here, is you're reducing the power by half. This would be normal power, and then if you wanted to give them like a high power, you could do a function like this, where you make the gain two, but you'd have to clip it at one and negative one, and it would give them more power. Okay. So there's a lot you can do with the, the driver controls from the joysticks with some of these functions. So, so basically, dead man, Controlling the gain, or, and then squaring is another option. So you really have three options you can play with when you're controlling the output of your joysticks. Okay? All right, another thing I want to go over real quick is uh, um, I want to walk through a scenario where we actually control shifting the gears. Okay? So, we let the driver, we give them a button where they can shift the gears, and we actually have a high and a low gear. So we created a what's called a state machine to control how we shift from a high gear to a low gear or a low gear to a high gear. Okay? And there's some reasons for that. Um, basically, if you can see this, this is a, how we kind of do a state diagram. So we start off, let's say we start off in low gear. Okay, we're going to be in state zero. And what we're actually doing is as we're in state zero, 
we're pulsing our solenoid because we had some issues with our, our, our shifter not engaging. So we tried a little thing here to um, pulse our solenoids and then it goes back to state zero. Okay. Now, once the driver presses you know, the shift button to shift to high gear, it's going to go through a state machine where it goes from low to high, state 10, and it may initialize, you know, set the solenoid to do the shift, and then it may wait a little bit, and then it will go to state 30 and say, okay, now we're in high gear. And then likewise, once we're in high gear, they may press the button to downshift. So then we'll go to state 20, we'll adjust the solenoid to shift to low gear, and then after some time, we'll go down to low gear and change our state. Okay. So a state machine lets you kind of control where you're at, where your code knows where the robot is at, the hardware is at. Okay. So we're actually, further on, we'll go through some more things that we actually added to the shifting because we actually reduce the power to the motors when we do the shift. And we're able to do that because of the state machine. Okay. Now, a state machine is basically a, uh, in Java, you use what's called a switch statement, and you have cases, okay? So I have a variable that says um, what state I'm in, and case 0 is going to be low gear, case 10 is going to be transition to high gear, and I'm basically going to write all my logic in a big case statement, okay, a switch statement where I have case 0, case 1, case 10, all the way up to case 30, okay? And inside each state, I'm going to put in my logic, my code for, um, do I want to adjust the solenoid, do I want to set a timer, um, things like that. So state machines is something that we use a lot in a lot of the, uh, the control of the robot. It makes it easier to follow and know where you're at. Okay. Why wouldn't you define a class and give labels to the states instead of using just numbers? You could, you could do, there's a lot of ways you can do constants, you can do a lot of things for your state machines. Um, what we tend to do is we actually create a class for each one of our state machines, and then we have all the logic inside of that class. So, yeah, it, it works pretty well that way. Um, and then you call, we usually call a process method, and then it will just run through the state machine. And then you call it every loop, and then we'll run through the logic. So, so there's a lot of there's a lot of documentation out there on state machines. You can find examples. Um, you know, different people develop state machines different ways. This is just the way that we uh, we've done it so far. Okay. So, a couple questions here. We'll um, see if everybody was paying attention. Um, so the parameter for the can talon, does anybody remember what the parameter is? Remember the number we had to set to it? C. Okay, the can device ID. Okay. Anybody know on the encoder, we didn't really talk about those, but it takes two values for inputs. Do you think those would be digital inputs? the left or right encoders, the PCM ports, or the digital I.O. ports. Okay, so we'll go through and figure out that. And then, um, so if you're doing Victor SP4, it'd probably be the fourth port, which port? Probably the digital I.O. Okay. And then this is the joystick class. Basically, you have to go through and figure out what axis goes to what um, joystick value. Okay. And then the last one is what Java statements used for the state machine. Switch. Okay. 
So switch statements used for the Java state machine. Etsy's one is your left vertical. <coughs> and then um, the Victor SP, that's the fourth digital I.O. port. And then the, um, the encoder uses digital inputs, so they're the digital D.I.O. ports. <coughs> Actually, they're the input ports. These are the output ports. Yeah. So that's kind of some of the overview of the telia. Yeah. The switch statement be one of things other Yes, you can do. They have to be numbers, but you can make constants. So you can put a, a label, a string label, and then you can make that a constant. Okay, but they do need numbers. Because the input to that switch statement is an integer, so it has to be an integer to use to make that switch. Okay, so so that's how the the switch statement works. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, you have talked about for um, your dead man uh, when you do that. What is the, what would you say is the easiest way to make that clipping? So, <laughs> I'd have to go through the logic, but I think what you'd have to do is, one way you could do it is say you said if the value is um, less than point, negative point 0.1, right. what you're going to do is you're going to say give me the joystick value, but then also you'd have to add 0.1 to it, right? To make that line match up with the zero. So that's what you'd have to do on both ends, okay? So the logic gets a little more complicated to making a nice smooth uh, transition. Chances are you wouldn't notice, but maybe you would. It all depends on how sensitive it is. I think I think we use this, but if your dead band is that small, you're not going to notice it anyways. If it's like 0.05, negative 0.05 to 0.05, you probably won't notice that little edge anyways. So, okay. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, yeah, we can go through, we use a state machine when we do that. So we'll go through, the next section is all time, so we'll actually kind of walk through a state machine for all time. So, um, it just makes it easier to track where you're at and debug the code. So, so that's the next section. So we'll go over all time next, and kind of the basics of that. We'll talk about the motor encoders a little bit more because we use encoders in all time. And then we'll talk about some of the other sensors, including the, the gyro for heading. And then we'll talk about the state machine control loop. Okay. So the main thing for all time, right? You have to um, you have to move the robot. Right? You're going to have to follow some kind of path. You're going to have to control your manipulators. Right? You're going to have to either pick up something or shoot um, something. You're going to have to support multiple scenarios. Right? You may have five different all-time modes you have to configure. Um, you're going to have to use some sensors for feedback on position. Because right? the robot does not know where it's at on the field unless you start using encoders or the gyro and everything, and then you'll probably also have to use sensors for target detection, right? Every game seems to have a target. So, like this last year with Stronghold, you had targets, you had a path you had to follow, um, you have to shoot the ball to, into a tower. This year, you had a path, you had to move the gears to a certain location and set them on the um, airship. You could also shoot balls into the uh, boiler. So I think 2018 will probably most likely have some path you're going to have to follow and probably some kind of targeting. Um, but you never know. So. 
So there's a lot to all time. So you have to think about all these different pieces. And then also, the last thing is you're under a time constraint, right? How many seconds do you have in all time? Dean, you 15 know. seconds. You, so. know. <laughs> you can actually do a lot in 15 seconds, but it's, it makes it interesting. Some years is 20. Okay. So we always use encoders for all time. It just it seems to be a, a pretty easy way to go. There's two ways we talked a little bit about setting up encoders. One is you can go as a digital input right into the Robo Rio. Uh, the second option is you can use the encoder breakout board as part of the Talon. Okay, so these are kind of the two options here. One is you have an encoder that goes right into the, the digital I.O. Um, it takes up more wires and that there is more wiring involved. Um, but you don't have to go with talons and you don't have to have the breakout board. Okay? The other option is you take the encoders and you go into the talon breakout board, which then connects to the talon motor controller, and then you have to connect CAN to that talon. Okay? So there's, there's two different options, and depending on which option you prefer, they both basically work very similar. Um, so this code, right, we kind of walked through this code last time with the encoders, uh, setting up the encoders, and then what we're going to do is, um, I want to calculate the position of the robot, okay? So in my code, um, I'm going to average the position of the left encoder plus the right encoder and divide it by two. Okay, so that's going to give me the average distance that the robot is moving. So even if it's turning a little bit left or right, if you take the average, it should give you a good calculation of the distance that you travel. Now, if one of the encoders comes unplugged or goes bad, it's going to mess you up anyway. So if you ever see someone's all time where the robot goes twice as far as it's supposed to, or if it you know, goes spinning, it's either an encoder went bad or a gyro went bad, or their wiring you know, came disconnected. Okay. All right, so then what we actually do is we actually look at calculating the velocity of the robot. So we basically say the velocity is that position minus the previous position, okay? And then we store a variable to store our previous position, all right? And then uh, that's how we calculate how far the robot travels. And we calculate this every loop in our all-time code, okay? So we'll go through uh, You can keep it as simple as that, or it can get more complicated if you want, but it, this works pretty good. Okay? So the next thing is, any questions on calculating the distance with the encoder? Okay. Yeah, yeah. And then if you want, we have sample code from last year. You're welcome to get a copy of it. It's sometimes it's a good thing or a bad thing because people may look at it and think, oh, this is too complicated, but it's, it's not too bad, so. Okay. Um, next thing is looking at some of the sensors, right? So if I have an IR distance sensor or a, um ultrasonic sensor, I'm going to connect those to the, uh, probably the analog input on the Robo Rio, and then a lot of the sensors will either go from 0 to 5 volts or 0 to 3.3 .3 volts, okay? So then that value is going to be some function of distance, right? So for instance, if we had a, uh, let's say the sensor said for 10 feet it gives you 5 volts, for uh, 1 inch it gives you 0 volts, right? So that's going to give you some function of distance. So now I can put some logic in my code and I can trigger on that to see 
if I exceed at a certain distance or I come too close to an object, I can trigger some logic. Okay. So to write that code, um, for example, here we have an analog input. So this is a class that comes as part of WPI mode. And then we're going to call the variable a forward IR distance sensor, basically. And that is the, the sensor variable. And then we have a variable to actually store the value that comes out of the sensor. Okay. So I have to initialize my, uh, my analog input. So I'm going to connect, say I connect that sensor up to port zero. I initialize it. And then in my process, which is going to be called every loop, I'm going to basically call get voltage. And then we'll read the voltage on that um, IR input sensor. And then that's going to give me a distance. Now I could also have a function here that converted it, right? If I need to convert it by some scaling or inverse it, I can do that in this logic. But um, it's pretty easy to set up an analog input and read the, the value from that input. Okay. All right. Um, some of these sensors, you probably want to look at the, there's data sheets on all of them. Some of them may need a resistor. Some of them will give you a curve of distance versus voltage, which you'll want to look at. Okay. Okay. Um, next one is the, the most useful sensor is the gyro. So if you want to do heading, and for all time, it's good to have the heading control. So we use the NAVX board. Okay. So this thing plugs right onto the Robo Rio, and it actually has expansion ports here. So these ports are actually expansion PWM ports. Okay, so like I was talking before, we can actually put extra motors up to these expansion ports if you're using the PWM um, vectors. Okay. Uh, the board plugs right in and it pretty much works off the bat. Um, the code isn't too hard. You basically set up a variable. Uh, the class they, they call it EHRS. I don't really know what that stands for. <laughs> but um, that's the class name that they use. And then you have to initialize that class. And you have to initialize it with a parameter to tell you that you're connecting it to the expansion port. Okay. So that basically tells you I just connected the gyro to my um, MSP expansion port. And then we actually put a try catch around here in case there was some error initializing the, the gyro. Um, maybe it became unplugged or something, and we can put an error message to the driver station. Okay. Um, and then when we call our process, we basically check to make sure it's initialized, and then we say the heading is equal to the angle. But we actually store a heading offset. So if we want to reset our gyro, we actually, we don't call a reset method on their class. We basically adjust our offset. Because we found that, at least the last time I looked, um, calling their reset didn't always work. So, so what we do is when we call our reset gyro, we set the heading equal to the current value, and then we subtract that off. So let's say the gyro's given back 60 degrees, we call reset, our heading offset is going to be equal to 60, and then next time we read the heading, we're going to basically get zero as our value for the heading. Okay. So there's really only a couple lines of code here to read the, the heading from that gyro sensor. Okay. Any questions on that? Yeah. Um, Yeah. 
I thought I put a note down here. Yeah. So Navet's documentation, it requires a separate installation for the extension libraries. Okay. So it's a separate class that's included. And did you run your Navet right? Because you, your picture shows it being right on local video. Is that the way you ran it? Yeah. Did you yeah. have any offset problems or anything? It worked pretty good. Yeah. We our robo reel was flat. There's a way you can configure it to go sideways as well, but we had it flat and we had a robo reel mounted pretty good. So it's pretty close to the center of the robot. Um, we were off to the side a little bit. And yeah, if you're trying to get perfect, you want your gyro to be in the dead center of the robot. But you it, can calculate some of that anyway, right? Yeah. So just play the offset. It's it's repeatability, right? If it's off to the side, it's going to repeat what you, what angle you expect anyways. So if you're off to the side, your left turn versus your right turn may be different degrees. But So if you want it exact, you want to put your uh, gyro in the center of the robot. So, somebody else had a question? Yeah, just how you want the magnets more for the embedded gyro than you did for the expansion? Or we tried to use the gyro that plugs into the SPI port or whatever that's right next to the Ethernet port. Yep. And the values were, let's just say crap, right? Yeah, and yeah. We, no. tried, we tried everything, tried going to digital input side, but we couldn't get it working with crap. Yep. Yeah, we found that this, the NAVATS is a much more reliable uh, sensor than just the little ones that plug into the SPI port. So that's why we switched to these. Because they actually have built in they have the built-in sits axes, so they they adjust for some yaw and pitch and everything. So that's why it's a much better signal that comes out of this. And it doesn't have as much drift. I don't know if you guys saw the same thing. It just does not drift like the little spy. Yeah, so I, I would not recommend. I would always, I would recommend these. They, they work pretty well. Plus you get the bonus of the expansion port. So, yep. And they sell that through Andy Mark and everything grew around. Yeah, just Google it. They're, I don't know, what are they, $89 now, something like that. So they work pretty good. Yeah, the, if you cross the road, has one called now a pigeon that hooks up through CAN, and you can mount that off board. So it's a little bit nicer packaging if you're trying to get it dead center. Yep. So your Roma reel can be mounted vertically somewhere and just wire it to the CAN. We used that last year. We had it. We've used the Navex probably five years now, but last year they had some driver issues early on, and, and it locked up both of our nabs. And okay. we bought a pigeon and just ran with it all year. Okay, so the the King N one worked quite well for you. Yeah. Okay. Really well. That's good to know. Yeah, I think they after seeing the Navex, I think they realized there's opportunity there to get a CAN version and, and make yeah. that work. So that's good. That's good to know. So yeah, and that's a lot of the sensors, you know, I think they're coming out with more and more sensors that can plug in a can and it just makes your wiring that much easier. So um, does it power right off the can or does it need a separate power? Uh, you have to feed it 12 volts. Okay. So you have to get it from the VRM yep. or some supplemental. Okay. So yeah, so there are options. You don't it's not required to go with this library, and then they probably have their own library for communicating yeah. with it. Yeah, they actually have it. You can plug it into an SRX too. And, uh, yeah, okay. If yeah. you want to do that, but yep. you don't have to. Okay. So yeah, there's a lot of options. <laughs> but by no means is this every option. So. Okay. Any other questions or thoughts on the gyro? Okay. So the next uh, next thing is basically talking a little bit more about the state machines. Okay. And this is just basically the approach that I kind of recommend just because it's easy to, to code and kind of easy to follow what state you're in. Um, but you can do it. There's different ways to code it. So this is not the only way to code. Uh, logic that's procedural. So in this example we have um, 
we want to do an all-time state machine, okay? And we're going to initialize our all-time at state zero. We're going to, at state 10, I believe we're going to lift the gear or um, do something with the gear. And then state 20, we're going to drive forward, okay? We're actually using velocity control. So we actually have a, a ramping class because we don't want to just set our set points and jump to a certain value. We like to ramp our values so that it's smoother. Um, so there's a separate ramping class. Okay. Um, so the code here, basically I have an all time, this was last year's code for all time center blue and we had a base class for all time, but it doesn't, it's kind of irrelevant here. Um, I have two classes for ramping. I ramp my target velocity and I ramp my target heading. Okay, so when I want to start moving forward, I'm going to set my velocity and I'm going to set my heading to zero. Okay. Um, my ramping class has a rate, so I can set my rate my maximum rate that I ramp. So what it does is it calls that class every 20 milliseconds. And for velocity, I'm, I believe velocity is zero to one. Um, I can only increase my velocity by 0.01 every 20 milliseconds. So that's my highest ramp rate, okay? And then for my heading, which is in degrees, I can adjust that by 0.9 every 20 milliseconds. So my ramp rate for my heading is a lot higher. Okay. So then I process, I call my process loop every 20 milliseconds and I use a switch statement. So state zero, I'm gonna initialize everything. So I have a bunch of variables. Um, I'm gonna put high gear as false. So I'm gonna make sure I'm in low gear. I, we have a gear manipulator, we call it. So we want it to, to be in the up position. So I put that as true. Um, I have a variable for auto drive velocity. I want to turn that on. I want to turn on my auto heading. So I turn both of those flags on. And I'm going to set my targets. So I want to set my target velocity to 0.3. So that's probably 30% speed in low gear. Um, I don't know exactly what that works out to feet per second, but um, <laughs> that's what we set it to. And then uh, I'm going to set my target heading to zero because I want to drive straight. And then once I initialized all this, I'm going to set my net state to 10. Okay. So what it's going to do is it's going to break and then it's going to um, exit this switch statement. So the next time around, in 20 milliseconds, this code will get called again, and then state is going to be equal to 10, okay? And then I'm going to drop down to case 10. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, set my gear manipulator flag to false, so I need to reset it, okay? There's just something we had to do on the robot to reset that. So then we'll go to the next state is 20. So then it will go through 20 milliseconds again, come back through the switch statement, and go down to case 20. Now that's where I'm going to drive forward. So I already set my target velocity, so it's already put in power to the motors to ramp it up to that value. And I'm going to basically say, drive forward until the motor position is greater than 1850 ticks. Okay, that may represent five feet um, we just used tick values and calibrated to that. We didn't try to convert everything to feet or inches or, or anything specific. Um, so once we hit that value, we weren't going to stop, we're going to slow down. Okay, so then what we do is we set our target velocity to 0.1. So that would make our robot slow down. And then we go to state 30. Okay. So I can basically put all my logic in these different states and I can then follow my code and, and work through the state. So as I'm testing, you know, I'll get to state 30 
then I'll stop, make sure everything worked, and I'll start over again. And then once I find an issue, I can focus on that state, and I'm not going to have to worry about breaking any of my other states. Okay. So it's always a good thing to code. Um, it lets you code things without breaking other code. That's the nice thing I like about state machines. Okay. Um, so does that make sense? Any questions? Yeah. Okay, so as you transition from state zero to state ten, or however you set the logic, you're setting the variables, right? But the variables have to be then used separately in another method to actually do something. Correct? Yes. Yes. Right? So if this process loop is getting called every, I, I guess my, my thought is how's how's the overall processing the robot real working? I mean, is it just sitting within this auton loop running? Sequentially, whatever you call in there. Yeah. So, so I mean, within process, right? It's going to go through, decide it's in case zero, and then execute the next five or six method calls, and then loop back type thing. Or is it yeah. So let me let's go through. I think I have a good slide. Okay. We can review that again. So this is this is the autom code, right? It's going to call autonomous method, and then it's going to run. In our autonomous code, we call run control loop. Okay, and then we have a while loop in there, and then inside that while loop, it's just going to repeatedly run. It's going to call this method process. Okay, so what we do is we put a delay in that while loop. So it runs our process method every 20 milliseconds, all right? So then that process method that would then run that state machine and that switch statement. Okay. So I think I let me see if I have an example. I think I go. This is what we need to go through. So this is the next part of my state machine. Okay, this is where I'm setting the values. Okay, so this is the last case. Let's say my last case was 130. Okay, and then 140, it was just going to sit there and basically do nothing. Okay, this is the end of my switch statement. Okay, so whenever whatever case I'm in, it's going to fall down to here, and then it's going to be whatever net state value I set. And then in this code here, what I do is I say net state, if it's not equal to the current state, I'm going to set the current state to net state. And then I keep a counter of how long I'm in each state. Um, so I can always use, because I know it's going to run pretty much consistently every 20 milliseconds, so I can basically do my own counter so I know how long I'm in each state. And I can use that as a, a fallback. In case the sensor doesn't work, so I'm not always stuck in a state waiting for the encoder or, or something like that. I'm going to fall back to using that time, that counter. Okay. So then, after my state machine, I'm going to call my ramping function. I'm going to call process, and then I'm going to set the power to the motor by getting the value from that ramping function. So I'm going to set my forward reverse power equal to the ramping get value, and then I'm going to set my um, my target heading equal to the ramp the heading ramping function. Okay, and then I just take those and then feed those motor power feed those powers into the motor. Okay. So that that's basically how. All our state machines are done this way. So you basically just, it's just by convention that we do it. We do this net state, and then we set it equal to the current state. If it changes, you don't have to do it that way. It just, it adds a little, a nice little counter to know how long you're in each, each state. That's really all it's doing. So, um, like, yeah. you know, so in one of your states where you were waiting for the encoder to get too big, 
you could just do like an if the counter is greater than some count. Yes. Go to the next state. Yep. Yep. So I don't think I. Yeah. So I'm doing that here. So what we do is we say if the motor position is greater than 1850 or my state count is greater than 200. So that's basically my timeout. Because I know state count is going to be incrementing. So 200 would wind up being 200 times 20 milliseconds would be what, 4 seconds? So it would basically say drive forward until the encoder basically told you you're there, or four seconds elapsed. And then after four seconds, what it's going to do is it's going to slow down and go to state 30. So on all of our states, we always, um, if we're dependent on some sensor value, we always put a timeout. Because, you know, just in case the sensor dies, um, you don't want the thing driving across the field <laughs> and getting a penalty or whatever. So. So that's why we always put a timeout in. Yeah. Uh, do you ever use a PID loop in some of this, or for the um, encoder? Or? We use the the state machines to set the targets for our PID controllers. Okay. okay. So we'll we'll run the PID controller code in the process loop, but we'll run the state machine before that, so that the state machine will set the targets for our PID controller. So if we want to do any kind of game scheduling or any target adjustment for our PID, um, we'll set those values in here. So those target velocity and target heading are actually the inputs to the PID controllers. Yeah? How is that 20 millisecond time uh, control determined? What's that? If you had 20 millisecond for that while loop control, how is that 20 millisecond determined? Um, just kind of... Uh, an estimated guess. Okay. Yeah, there's no, there's no empirical data saying that's the best thing to work with. But okay. um, the Robo Reel seems to have enough power. You could probably do a 10 millisecond loop, maybe. But uh, we, 20 milliseconds worked fine. I think one year we did 40, and that worked fine as well. So we actually did. Um, we did the one year I think we used 40. We had a camera server running, so the Robo Reel was a lot higher in CPU usage. Um, but this year we used 20, and we had an off-board camera processing, so it worked fine. Yep. Okay. Any other questions? All right. All right. Um, so that's your state machine. Um, I want to talk about one more thing here as part of uh, um, troubleshooting and, and trying to read the data. Does everybody, how many people know what a smart dashboard is or used it? Okay, so quite a few people have used it. So smart dashboard is a nice tool where you can basically in your code for your robot real code, you can write variables and you can write them out as a, a you can give that variable a name, and then you can see it on that smart dashboard on the driver station or on another laptop that's connected to your robot Wi-Fi. And it's a very good tool for debugging. And uh, like we print out our heading, we print out our state, we print out our state count, uh, the, the position of the encoders, um, the velocity of the robot, the target velocity, the target heading, um, and then the IR distance. So we print all this out on the smart dashboard so we can see all our variables. Okay. So it's a very useful tool. So that's one um, thing I want to go through in a few is actually go through how to, how to do a, an example with uh, using the smart dashboard for a PID controller. Okay. All right. Um, multiple autons. So uh, from last year, who had more than four auton modes from last year? So a couple. Yeah. I can't remember how many we had. We had, we had at least six. So. 
but um, you need a way to select between the different all time modes. Okay? And there's a lot of different ways you can do that, but this is just an example of how um, we selected the all time mode from last year. You basically use the smart dashboard where you set the all time mode from the driver station. And then you can read that value in the Robo Rio code. So I have a desired all time mode, which you set from the smart dashboard. We actually had an extra load because we had all times where we could select whether to shoot or not as part of the all time. So that was our extra parameter. And then we would basically um, go into a switch statement based on our desired all time mode. And then we create a new all time class based on that mode. So like all time one was left blue, um, all time two was center blue, all time three I think was like right blue, and all time four was left red, center red, and right red. Because we had encoders, so our encoder values would be different based on red or blue, and because the fields were never consistently exactly the same position for the airship. So we actually had different all times for every position. So made it uh, made it interesting, but it, it made it easy to know which code to change. So, so it's just this is one way, another way you can use a switch statement to uh, select your all time mode. Okay? And then after we select our all time mode, we run our control loop, which does the uh, while loop. Okay. Um, another good thing with the Auton is um, when we're in this uh, running the Auton, I believe uh, we wrap it in a try catch block. Right? So if we have any exception in Auton, we can catch that and then know what happened, and then it will proceed to tell you out without a problem. So that's how we did multiple all times. Okay. Um, let's see. These look like the same. Damn, we don't have to necessarily go through these. All right. So that's that's a summary. That's what we did for. Uh, that was for kind of the first session to go through things. Um, any questions on, on that? Okay. The next section I want to go through is going to be a little. It's going to be a little more work. We're actually going to go in Eclipse and try to import the project that I gave you on the, the flash drive. So. Give me one second in your own turn now. Okay, so let's... I'm going to have to pull up my PowerPoint here, but before I do that, 
So bring up Eclipse, and then in Eclipse you're going to see a project. You're going to see a folder called um, Kettering. Twenty seventeen. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna it's gonna be under Java. Okay. And then what you're gonna try is you're gonna go into Eclipse and you're gonna say file import. And then you can say existing project into the workspace. And then you're going to select that directory. You're going to say, um, wherever you put that folder in, you're going to say Java and then Kettering 2017 and then hit OK. And then it should build up a, a project tree for you.
So this is what we're trying to demonstrate here is now you can control your PID controller through the network tables and the smart dashboard and see it working. So. Okay. Yeah, but on, essentially right on a network table, you're, you're declaring a variable that you can put and get to, right? So yep. this, this viewer is essentially, you're mimicking what your robo Rio would be actually calculating. Yes. So yep. you're, you're quote going in there and typing it, but that would be the code putting those values. Correct. Code. Yep. Yeah, I'm manually doing it here just to demonstrate it. But I would want to write an autonomous program that would actually do it all itself. Okay. All right. So anybody get this working? Okay. All right. So um, does anybody have the project running where the project actually runs? Do you guys have the project where it runs? No. Yeah, it's like immediately when I change the target box, they do one, it just changes the zero. Okay. So what do you need to change a dot target? That's a value you have to change. And then you also have to change a dot kp. Okay. So you want to change a dot target and change that to one point zero, and then change a dot kp it goes to zero point eight. Okay, so then that should actually change things. Okay.